This morning, we continue in the season of Advent, the series that is campus-wide called Protagonist. And as we walk through this Advent journey, we are intentionally entering into the story of Israel, where we see God at work throughout all of the pages of Scripture. God is the protagonist. And we're spending our days waiting, hoping, anticipating for God to show up in our own lives and in our own midst. The word Advent means the innovation of something, the arrival of someone. And culturally speaking, when we use that word, oftentimes we're talking about the advent of some new technology. And so the advent of the smartphone promised to give us the world in our fingertips and ability to multitask and be efficient. It feeds our obsession with time. But if we take a step back and really consider how these things dominate our lives, our children's life, we see that's not necessarily the case. We are more mastered by the advent of this technology, distracted. We lose track of time. Anxiety steps in and fills us. In the kingdom imagination, Advent pushes back hard against all of that and invites us to wait, to slow down and let hope build. And last week we learned that that word wait means the same as hope. And so we do just that. During Advent, we remember and anticipate the comings of the Christ. And we say this repeatedly so that it gets into our soul because it's so much more than four weeks out of the year. We remember, we anticipate the comings of Christ. He came once and we prepare to celebrate his birth. He comes repeatedly through the proclamation of the word and the power of his Holy Spirit. And Jesus Christ is coming back And all of that is ripe with hope, and we don't want to miss a beat. We want to orient ourselves to this message of Advent, to the larger story, and learn what it means to wait. Isaiah, the prophet, does exactly that, and he invites us to do it with him. He lived and prophesied towards the end of Israel's kingdom reign, and he predicted their being conquered by Babylon being led into exile, but he also prophesied that one day liberation would be would come, they'd be allowed to return to their homeland. Isaiah 1 through 39, chapters 1 through 39 is painful and difficult. And there's a lot of calling out the sins of the people, pointing to the judgment that is coming because of those sins. But Isaiah 40 is a new beginning in this book. Chapters 40 through 66, we see a distinct shift in Isaiah's tone. It's the second half of Isaiah, almost the gospel according to Isaiah. And that shift happens in the passage that we read this morning, beginning with verse 1, in a word, comfort. And that's the basic breakdown of this book, Isaiah. A shift between chapters 1 through 39, 40 through 66, And this passage that we've read is the turning point, the hinge point of the whole book of Isaiah, where we see a restorative movement from trial to rest, preparation to fulfillment, waiting to arrival, from searching to finding. Throughout this season of Advent, Isaiah is intentional to connect the present moment of his people to the past and much more so to the future. This is the reason for Advent, for the comfort, comfort mentioned in verse 1 and in the verses that follow, in particular in verse 3, we see that there are two parts to this restorative movement. A voice of one calling, in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. So first, let's talk about the wilderness. In that familiar language, there are references back to the whole story of God. And some scholars think this is a reference to Moses. It's a reference to the Exodus. 
the second book of the Bible, the book of Exodus, we see that Israel had gone into an Egypt because of a famine in their homeland. They were in Egypt for a period of 430 years. Think about the generations and the numbers that amassed. And they flourished. But at some point in time, they became a threat to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, who subjected them to harsh working conditions, and that is an understatement. We're talking oppression and judgment and slavery. But God heard the cry of his people. They were not even necessarily crying out because of their plight, not necessarily crying for help, even crying out to God, and God intervened. Moses led God's people straight out of Egypt. And in that story, God is the protagonist, breaking generations free from their oppression, delivering them from their slavery and bondage to the mightiest empire in the known world at that time, Egypt. God brought Pharaoh to his knees. But in Israel's journey, there was a wilderness moment from that point to the promised land. They began to wander for 40 years to be exact, complaining about how good they had it in Egypt. The food was better, the king was better. Let's go back, Moses, you're an awful leader. Who's our God, where is he? They wandered through the desert on their way to the promised land. And Isaiah's audience here at another time, they would have picked up on those references to the exodus and to the wilderness wanderings. This was a defining moment for the people of God. They knew what Isaiah was talking about. Having been exiled themselves for 70 years, led out of Israel to Babylon, who was then conquered by the Assyrians, they're finally allowed to return to their homeland and Israel's wandering yet again. Isaiah's prophetic imagination speaks to the present moment. His is a voice of one calling. In the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. At the same time that Isaiah is looking back into the whole story of God, there is a prophetic glimpse into the future. Some 700 years to the time in which Jesus was born. And in particular, six months earlier, his cousin was born, John the Baptist, in the New Testament. He was the fulfillment of Isaiah 40 in that he was the trailblazing mouthpiece of the voice in the wilderness. But more than the words he spoke, he embodied that voice, acting it out by living in the wilderness proclaiming the coming of the way. John the Baptist was the forerunner to the long-awaited Messiah, preparing the way for another exodus of God's people out of their bondage to sin and slavery. And even though Rome was the mightiest empire at the world at that time, this exodus dealt with something far greater, the shame of sin, the sting of death, John the Baptist is a vital part of these four weeks, our Advent season, and yet this baby born six months prior to Jesus is notably absent from the nativity scene, and we don't see him in any snow globes. John the Baptist is a forgotten character. It's like he's an ingredient in this recipe, a seasoning that conjures up a taste, but you're not sure exactly what it is. Something is off. His message is hard. John the Baptist is that clarion call to repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He sounds the note of repentance during the season of Advent. In fact, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 8, John the Baptist called out the comfortable, religious, people, elite, leaders, all of us, saying, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And maybe this is why he's not found in any snow globe. He's like, what's all this tinsel, all the lights? I came to drop a mic. Repent. The kingdom is at hand. 
And we see him in all four gospels. And he quotes the prophet Isaiah, chapter 40, verse three, when he says, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. What does it mean to make straight paths for Jesus? Where every valley will be raised up, every mountain made low, a straight path for the coming of the way. What does that look like? It looks like change. One of the greatest coaches of all time is Vince Lombardi, coached the Green Bay Packers way back in the day. He coached them to the first two NFL championships of the modern era, the Super Bowl. That trophy given to the champion each year is named for him. And Vince Lombardi said, the only thing more important than the will to win is the will to prepare to win. Prepare the way. Let's jump to another coach in another sport, Jim Valvano, coach of the North Carolina State Wolfpack. Way back in 1983, his team was, they were okay. Finished the regular season 19 and 10. They were a sixth seed when March Madness came around. Found themselves in the championship game playing the University of Houston Cougars. Phi Slamma Jamma, that basketball fraternity that included arguably the greatest center of all time, Akeem Olajuwon, I'm a fan. <laughs> Akeem the Dream, Clyde the Glide Drexler, North Carolina State Wolfpack met up with U of H in the finals that year of March Madness. And way back in the beginning of the season, Jim Valvano brought a ladder and a pair of scissors out to the first practice. And his players were curious. Much more so, they were dumbfounded when he asked them to cut the nets off of that goal. Day two, he brought that ladder and the scissors out again. Do it again. On the third day, they did it again. And Jim Valvano wanted his team to see themselves doing the things that champions do after final four victories. Cut down the nets. That year they cut down the nets and they won it all. Phi Slamma Jamma, hmm. <laughs> they won the championship. Prepare, what does it mean to prepare the way? It means to cut down the nets, to see yourself, ourselves, doing the things that Christians do. And so we picture him coming because that's what Advent is all about. He came once. He comes repeatedly. Jesus is coming back. There's only one thing left to happen in our story. He comes all the time. We are waiting for Jesus' triumphant return and final victory. And so we live each day with that in our mind's eye, in our soul, that vision governing all we are, everything we do, how we live our lives. Jesus breaking into time and space, circumstance right here, right now, repeatedly, ultimately, yes. it's as good as gold. So may that vision be deep within you and me and we who gather and scatter week in and week out church. God is the protagonist in the story who entered into time and space way back when his people were wandering through the wilderness in Moses' day, way back when Isaiah was leading his people through the wilderness back to the promised land, way back even in John the Baptist's day, but even and especially your day, my day, the wilderness we find ourselves in, there is a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way, make straight paths for him. And so what does it mean to prepare the way for the Lord? It means two things. Remember, first and foremost, Isaiah was speaking to a people on the way out of the wilderness of Babylon, reminding them have of God's activity throughout their experience as a people 
exercising prophetic imagination towards the future as God's salvation was coming again and again. God has been preparing the way out of the wilderness at God's initiative. Salvation is God's doing. The kingdom of God is at hand. It has now come, and of its reign there shall be no end. And so we've looked back, we've looked forward. I want to invite you to look past John the Baptist into our own circumstance, because I know that there are many of us who find ourselves in a wilderness moment. Maybe you've been in one this season, this year. Marriage is in the room, on the brink of disaster. Parents in this room whose heart breaks for their adult children to find their way back to Jesus. People in this room struggling with identity and purpose, battling with sin, addiction of any kind. Let me remind you that when the Israelites were crying out, it wasn't necessarily for help, it wasn't even necessarily to God. He sees you in the wilderness. At God's initiative, he steps into the story of our lives to bring hope, to bring the peace of Christ. This is all God's initiative. Second, the word prepare actually also means repent. And so during this season of Advent, there's an invitation to repentance, which so often turns into behaviorism. If I could just be better, do better, but we're not talking about behavior modification. We're talking about heart transformation, which comes by the word of God. J.D. Walt said, if you want to win the day, you've got to win the morning. If you want to win the morning, you've got to give Jesus the first word. And so we pursue Christ at his initiative through his word. That's why we read the Bible in community. Bible in a year. Gospels in 90 days, Psalms in a month, our Advent devotional. That's why we read scripture in worship, in community, because we want to give God the first word and win the day. J.D. told a story recently from his teenage years. He woke up, he saw a light down the hall, and so he walked down to see what that light was. And there very early in the morning, he's still in high school, there was his dad sitting in a chair, eyes closed, lips moving, but nothing coming out of his mouth, Bible in his lap. He discovered his dad praying and reading scripture. And in that moment, J.D. was given a vision for his own life. That's when he started drinking coffee, waking up early, giving God the first word. And God has done wonders in his life, charting the course. If we give God the first word day in and day out, what might God do through a people committed to him in that manner? Church, repentance isn't stop. Repentance isn't don't do it. Repentance is start. Do it for one day. Then do it again. Repentance is saying yes. It's reorienting your life towards Christ 
And for some in the room, it may be orienting for the very first time. Repentance is actually sowing seed into the soul of your life. And what's the seed? It's the word of God. So first and foremost, salvation is God's doing. And it comes at God's initiative. He sees you. He meets us in the wilderness. Second, to prepare is a response to his initiative. It's an invitation to repentance, to start doing the things that Christians do and to see ourselves. Christ entering into our wilderness meeting, Christ coming repeatedly. One day, Christ coming in ultimate and final victory, breaking into our wilderness moments. So let me give you a prayer that I've been repeating for weeks all the way back to All Saints Day. When we remember that you're not alone. The saints are in this race with us. And since that time, I've been praying, Jesus, I give everyone and everything to you. I give everyone and everything to you, God. I give myself to you. Do that for a day and another. And let's see ourselves as the people God has invited us to be at his initiative. Church Advent is a necessary part of the story where we stop we wait and we experience this movement from trial to rest, from preparation to fulfillment, from waiting to arrival, from searching to finding. But the good news, even better than finding, is being found. And during this season of Advent, we don't find the way, the way finds us. And it invites us in a moment of surrender to follow his way in all of life. So as we wait for the comings of Christ, let's do just that. Let's respond in our wilderness moment, one day at a time. Join me as we pray. Lord God, we are grateful for your presence in our midst grateful that you took the initiative to wait on us and in our showing up, Lord, as we've waited on you, as we respond to you, would you respond just the same? Lord, fill us with hope, fill us with peace, meet us in our wilderness moments and more so lead us out of them that we might have your preferred vision for the rest of our lives. Thanks for finding us. Save us to the uttermost. In Jesus' name we pray.